number of people are going to join in, but I don't want to, to keep everyone. Um, thank you, first of all, for being here. Thank you for accompanying uh, uh, me and all of us, accompanying each other uh, on, this, uh, on this journey. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you for being here. And um, uh, I was, we were going to engage in one of our study sessions uh, on, the, on, on the subject of our scrolls and on the subject of the way the scrolls uh, really speak to our lives, which is what we've been doing. But given what's happened yesterday, um, uh, during the day and overnight, I felt that it was important for us to, um, to come together in a different way and to reflect for a moment and to offer to ourselves a moment of uh, gratitude and a moment of relief and a, um, and a little bit of an explanation and a sense of what is going on to set ourselves up for what is going to uh, hopefully um, occur uh, in, in the future, in the future in terms of also our learning, uh, because I think it's all related everything we are talking about is so profoundly and deeply related. Um, I have uh, uh, slept a few hours, a couple of hours, and uh, I uh, have prepared a little bit of a PowerPoint for us for today. Um, that's very different from what we were going to do. Um, and I would like to... Um, share some of it with you and to go back and forth with that PowerPoint. And I'm going to ask you at different points to unmute. And I would like us to participate in this moment together and to not only uh, hear from me, but to hear from each other and for us to speak to each other uh, about the events of the last day and where we find ourselves here today and what we make of the events that have been taking place. Um, let me start out very briefly, if I may, with um, uh, a, little, a few words uh, about uh, Rabbi Citron Walker and about the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, let, me, let me try to, um, to contextualize this and to do this briefly and to say this in a way that, uh, that, that you, would, you would appreciate. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the pictures from Congregation Beth Israel and of Rabbi Citron Walker. Um, so let me, let me share my screen for a moment and do, uh, and do a little bit of that and then come back with you. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue, we'll, we'll, we'll start from there and we'll continue, okay? Um, so so let's, let's start with that. Um, and Jordan, if I may ask that you, uh, you look at the um, waiting room and see whether people want to join in. And... Okay, so um, uh, this uh, is Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker. Um, Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker um, was a student at Hebrew Union College and entered the college um, as um, the second intifada was raging in that year wherein it wasn't clear whether our entering students would uh, travel to Jerusalem or not, um, and ended up on the Cincinnati campus. So uh, Rabbi Citron Walker, um, is, uh, is really one of those students whom I got to know very well. And I got to know Rabbi Citron Walker uh, especially well um, and uh, really, uh, I don't know how, how else to say this, and be became close to him. This became a person with whom I developed a friendship. And uh, uh, Rabbi Citron Walker didn't just grow to become uh, that special 
presence in my life. He took four courses with me and uh, wrote his senior thesis with me uh, under, under my supervision as a faculty member and under the supervision of another professor uh, called Sam Joseph, Samuel Joseph, um, who actually came to uh, my installation here at the temple to celebrate with us. And Rabbi Citron Walker's rabbinic thesis was on the subject of rabbinic literature and teaching rabbinic literature uh, and teaching it in a way that leads to action. Um, this is uh, something that really changed my life. This was a rabbinic thesis that changed my life as a professor, as a teacher at HUC, uh, and my view of the rabbinate. And uh, uh, in many ways, I think was formative to his rabbinate. Um, Rabbi Citron Walker was one of those people who were particularly interested in doing, not just in, um, in, in not just in many ways in studying and in, in preaching, but in turning rabbinic literature into action. Um, and his entire rabbinate uh, has been that kind of rabbinate, wherein uh, he would uh, not only teach and preach, but he would do and, uh, and turn the learning and turn especially his passion for rabbinic literature and for Talmud and those uh, areas that you know, we studied together into action uh, in the world and, and, and in his rabbinate. Um, when I visited them, uh, both uh, Rabbi um, Charlie and his wife Adina, in Colleyville with, with their very young family at the time. One of the first things that uh, Rabbi Citron Walker and his wife Adina did um, was to um, invite me to a group that Adina, uh, Charlie's wife, was actually leading, which was an interfaith group of Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faith leaders who were women uh, in the Colleyville area. And she was a pioneer in this work and one of the people who really gathered all of these together. Um, and, uh, and Charlie was doing this on his end. And this was something that was especially important to him. So I, I just want to suggest, I want you to hear uh, that uh, Rabbi Citron Walker's work in Colleyville, Texas, um, and his passion and his learning and the way all of that has unfolded, um, all of these have been especially important and not only important, but all of these um, have been in certain ways, traits that he took from his undergraduate studies all the way to his graduate studies and training to be a rabbi at HUC um, and onto his rabbinate in Texas and beyond Texas. Let me stop my screen sharing for a moment. Um, uh, when I visited with, with, um, with them uh, on the occasions that I was with them, and I've been with them a number of times, um, I want you to know that this was uh, not just a mission, but a passion of, uh, of the rabbinate of, of Charlie Citron Walker. So I want you to know that the fact of, um, uh, the fact of, I think, uh, uh, Charlie Citron Walker's uh, ordeal and a group of more than two dozen faith leaders gathering in the junior high school in Colleyville, Christians, Muslims, Jewish, and others, is not just a tribute to the strength of the Jewish community in Texas. It's not just a matter of this is the way things are, people come together. It is a tribute to the work that he had done. It is a tribute to the way he handled his rabbinate 
from the very moment he arrived in Coleyville and beyond that time that he arrived in Coleyville. Um, and, uh, and I want you to know that this has been something that has animated him every single day. Um, uh, just another personal word here. Um, when Rabbi Citron Walker uh, wrote his thesis about service learning and about the way service learning might be incorporated and action might be incorporated into the learning of rabbinic literature, which was something that you know, we discussed a great deal and that we worked on together um, for his rabbinic thesis. Uh, this was something that had a profound influence on me. And I eventually ended up teaching courses in rabbinic literature that became service learning courses, wherein students would study rabbinic literature and go out and do work in the community, uh, especially with minority and, and, uh, and underserved communities in the greater Cincinnati area, and then come back and do more learning and reflection on the basis of the service learning model. That I credit to uh, my work with this particular student and this particular rabbi and the influence that, that it had on me. Uh, and I think in many ways shaped the direction that I would, I would go in for, for many more years to come. Um, you can well understand and imagine, I think, the degree to which the events of the last day um, have hit a number of us who have been close to him for many, many, many years, uh, for now uh, approximately 20 years. Um, and, uh, and the degree to which um, we have been affected by what has now happened uh, uh, and, and the degree to which we are, we are grateful uh, for the conclusion uh, of this ordeal. But I, I want for a moment to contextualize uh, this moment with Rabbi Citron Walker, and not only this moment, but the rabbinate of, of Charlie Citron Walker and his passion and his mission in the world, which includes engagement with the community, engagement across religious lines, interfaith work, and especially work with various Christian and Muslim leaders. Um, a number of Muslim leaders has been a leader in this area really uh, in, in Coleyville, Texas. Finally, I don't know if you remember this, but a number of months ago, there was a prominent story that related to a school district in Texas, wherein a superintendent was recorded as saying in public, at a public meeting to teachers, that when they teach the Holocaust, they would have to teach the other side. I don't know if you remember this, that this occurred. This was Charlie Citron Walker's district. And it was Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker who went out and who diffused this situation and who effectively brought this superintendent around uh, through his work and through his connection with a number of faith leaders and his ability to reach out to uh, the educators of the district. So I want, I, I want you to have a sense of the rabbi, and I not only want you to have a sense of the rabbi, I want you to have a sense of the rabbi, the trajectory, the way the rabbi has uh, thought of himself and of his rabbinate, the family engagement of this rabbi, and uh, the greater mission that this represents and the degree to which these have been important issues for us. Um, and I wanted to start with that. I wanted us to get a sense of that uh, for just a few minutes. There's a great deal more that I could say. Uh, there's a great deal more that I might say, but I do not want to enter into more personal details. Uh, this is just by way of framing. And I just want you to get a sense of this particular rabbinate and what I think is a model for the kind of rabbinate that we need to take seriously and something that's been especially important to me. Um, there is a reason for which um, I, 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 I function the way I function and I try to do the things that I try to do and I try to build bridges where I try to build bridges and they're not accidental. And my interactions with people like Rabbi Citron Walker, uh, my friend, are, are among them. 
and uh, and I just want to put this on the table and to recognize this. Uh, so first of all, again, for uh, for all of you who are joining us as we're as we're speaking, thank you for joining us. Um, I deeply appreciate your joining us and us being together at this moment, at this moment of a sigh of relief and at a moment of real gratitude, which we're about to talk about. Um, and this is just a, a moment of introduction uh, that I think might explain um, the degree to which some of us have taken these last 24 hours personally, and to which we've been, we've been affected by them and have been praying for everyone's well-being in Texas. I'm going to take, I'm going to pause for a moment and allow for you to, to make comments or to ask questions or to, um, to engage in, in what we've done so far uh, up to now. And, and we'll, we'll continue in a moment. If anyone wants to say anything, this is a great moment uh, to, 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 to say something, to welcome everyone, to greet each other, and to just offer each other a, a little blessing of peace. Rabbi, good morning. It's Steve Miller. It's extremely helpful to hear about and know of your personal relationship. We all feel deeply connected and affected, and yet it really bridges the miles and the distance and the natural sense of disconnection. So having met Sam, uh, knowing you, and hearing your stories about Rabbi Charlie is extremely helpful to setting the tone of understanding even how to think and read about this. I'll also quickly mention that the collection of stories listed in the New York Times this morning included some a, a nice profile piece about him and a short profile piece about the synagogue itself, not just the news story. So it's it's worth it to take a quick look. Rabbi? Yes, yes, please. Uh, Ava, is that you? Yeah, it's Ellen Markell. I have COVID, so I'm just laying here sick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, could we have more of that kind of revenant in our temple? That's really a wonderful question. Uh, you know, Ellen, um, for my installation, I brought in Christian clergy and Muslim clergy and an African-American musician. We have launched recently a racial justice task force we have expanded our social action. We have expanded our assistance to the Thomas Jefferson Academy for Refugees uh, in our city. We are building relationships with faith leaders and congregations around us. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, the work that so many are doing in our community including many who are on this call, whether it is with regard to voter registration and ensuring that people are able to vote or bringing food and supplies to people or building relationships with other faith communities and working on racial justice and us becoming an increasingly anti-racist congregation that all of this work is not going unnoticed. Um, this is something that I hope uh, is very much part of my rabbinate, and, um, and I, uh, I appreciate your support for it and your wish for it, and, uh, and I hope that all of those who wish to participate in this work, which I consider holy work, step up and, uh, and, and work with us uh, to, to, to make this a reality and to turn this uh, kind of Jewish life, because it's not just a rabbinate, it's Jewish life, to turn this kind of Jewish life into a reality for, for all of us. Um, so, so thank you for that, and I hope, I, I hope that this is helpful. And thank you, Steve, for your, for your comments, and Alison, I see that you've, you've commented in the chat, and I, I, I appreciate that too. 
Um, anyone else before we before we continue? Um, so yeah, Kim Cole has has just uh, added here uh, that that she's come to know of a number of people who have known um, uh, uh, Rabbi Citron Walker, um, and um, it, and and it again goes to show how small our world is and how interconnected our world is and how the things that happen in Coleyville, Texas, are not things that happen in Coleyville, Texas they in certain ways happen to all of us and with all of us and and they affect all of us and i think that we need to speak about how they affect all of us and uh, and what they mean for all of us so thank you um thank you for this um i um i wanted to um engage in a moment of prayer with you today and in a moment of reflection and especially in a moment of thanksgiving. Uh, because you never know how these kinds of situations end. And we are so deeply grateful to the law enforcement officials who have handled the situation in the way that they've handled it. And for the support of so many in the community, Jewish and non-Jewish, to the congregation uh, and to the family of Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker and to him personally now. Um, and I, I wanted to take a moment with you, if that's okay, to think about a couple of prayers and blessings in our liturgy and for us to reflect upon them, to think about them, and to think about our place in the world and our place in this country, our need to do the work in the face of uh, what sometimes are dangers that we do not know are lurking and that are lurking for so many, not just for us, but for so many in so many different areas uh, and that must not discourage us from getting up and from doing the kinds of things that we need to do. Um, so if that's okay, unless anyone else has more to say, I'd like to share my screen again. And let's move towards a moment of reflection and a moment of prayer. And I'd like to start by introducing a blessing that comes into our liturgy uh, in the early Middle Ages called Birkat HaGomel, uh, which is a blessing that we utter after we emerge from a dangerous situation. And after we emerge from a dangerous situation, in the context of which uh, we are somehow, uh, in one way or another, spared. And, uh, and I, uh, I want us to, for a moment, think about this notion of all of us, in one way or another, being spared. All of us in one way or another, escaping danger. All of us in one way or another, escaping situations uh, that might have completely altered our lives, the direction of our lives and our life to begin with, us being alive. I'd like us to for a moment reflect on this and to reflect on this also in the context of what we've just experienced in the last 24 hours. And I'd like you to go through this prayer with me, this blessing with me for a moment, and then we will come back together yet again, and then go through hopefully another piece of liturgy, if that's okay. So let me again share my screen with you for just a moment, and then we'll come back. Here is the blessing that I want to share with you. And that blessing is called Birkat HaGomel. Um, 
the blessing of, if you like, uh, God as rescuer. Uh, and the notion of us somehow not being deserving or not being um, entitled to expect to be rescued from all kinds of dangers and all kinds of situations, the notion that this does not go without saying, the notion that somehow this is not something that we are entitled to think of as uh, going and uh, as something that we're entitled to take for granted. The Hebrew for it is Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaGomel Lachayavim Tovot Shegmalani Kol Tov. And the translation that I've offered here for it is blessed are you the source of life, right? Sovereign of the universe who grants good, and here the good can be with a capital G or with a small g, and I have decided to use a small g uh, to the chayavim, to the liable, legally liable or undeserving, to the people who are somehow guilty uh, because all of us are somehow imperfect and guilty and liable and undeserving and who nevertheless has granted to me goodness. Um, so there are a couple of things that I want to immediately highlight about this first part of the blessing. The first is the shift from the plural to the singular. And the notion that um, there is something out there, there is a force out there, which is a force of good and of goodness that grants goodness, that grants us the ability to overcome and to escape uh, moments of danger, moments of, of, of uh, uh, fear, moments of distress, moments of isolation, moments of real concern. And I want, I want us to, for a moment, think about that. And I'm asking each and every one of us to, for a moment, take that in and take in the notion that we might not have been here and we might not have been here in the way that we are here. Um, and that not everyone is here, and that we are here, and that we are here because of goodness that is out there, that has enabled us to be here, and not because we are by definition deserving of being here, but there is a certain degree of happenstance that has acted in our lives and has enabled us to be who we are and to function the way we function to be the kinds of people that we might be. And um, that these, th this is something that we want to take into our lives, into our consciousness, uh, into our understanding at this time. There is a force out there that's a general force. And from that understanding, to be able to for a moment say, well, wait a minute, how does it function for me, what has it meant for me? Uh, you know, moments like this that we witness with regard to other people and personal friends and people with whom we've been in touch for decades um, are moments that allow us the opportunity to take a step back and to think about our lives their lives, the lives of our loved ones, to think about what it is that we are about and why it is that we are here. Um, and for a moment to recognize that we are the recipients of goodness, not only in a general sense, but that I am the recipient of goodness in a very direct and personal sense. 
And let's start with that. And for a moment, let's think about this and let's consider this. Because this recognition, this acknowledgement, this understanding that we are the recipients of goodness allows us to hope for future goodness to then come to us, which is the second part of this prayer blessing. The first part is a blessing, the second is a prayer, which opens the door to us asking for additional goodness to come into our lives. Um, I want to stop the sharing for a moment and I want, to, I want you to see me and I want to see you. And I want us to recognize that this is a moment wherein we are commanded to utter this blessing and to say these kinds of words, the birkata gomel that I have just shared with you. Um, and for us to say it for a moment, each to ourselves here together. Uh, this is a moment for us. Let us also make it a moment of gratitude. Let us also make it a moment of recognition that things don't have to be the way they are. And that sometimes the terrible dangers and the terrible issues that occur in our world, these moments sometimes end well and allow us to be here and to do the kind of work that we're doing. I'm going to ask everyone here to take a moment and to think for themselves, each and every one of us, of those moments out of which we have emerged and that have shaped our lives and have allowed us to be here, the people that we are, and the kind of uh, the kind of people that allow us to be together, and to doing what we do. So let's just take a moment and and continue in just a couple of seconds. So for all of us here uh, in this virtual room, let me just say, to begin, for the, just for a start, that I hope and pray and wish for continued goodness, and that I hope and wish for and pray for not only continued goodness, but for us to continue to be spared, to continue to be spared trouble, to continue to be spared danger, to continue to be spared distress, distress, and for us to continue to be able to do the things that we want to do and to live the lives that we want to live. Uh, this is a moment for us to engage in this kind of recognition, in this kind of prayer, and in the commitment to continue to do good, and to continue to do good because it's our job to do good. It is our mission to do good. We are here to do good. It is not only that we are recipients of good, but that the goodness has to spread and that we must be the ones to spread the good. Um, so I want really to start with that. We are obligated in our religion to engage in Birkat Gomel, and I was grateful for the opportunity to share it with you for a moment and to pray together and to recognize this moment and on that basis to, to continue to move forward. So. Thank you for this and for allowing 
all of us to fulfill this religious obligation. Um, let's continue with gratitude for a moment. And let's not just continue with gratitude for a moment, but let's continue with the blessing of gratitude, the paradigmatic blessing of gratitude of our tradition. Uh, this is part of the Amida. What we are about to engage in is part of the Amida. It is part of the Shmona Esre, the 18 blessings that we recite. Uh, we don't normally recite this blessing in our Friday night service, uh, which is the reason I want to share this moment with you. Um, and I would like to, for a moment, recognize goodness and then talk about goodness and blessing and gratitude in our lives and what we do with it in terms of our work and how it is that we move forward. So let me share my screen and let's continue uh, for, for just one moment. And I will, uh, I will just share my screen for a moment and then we'll come back together. This is the Modima Nachnulach that we will find, that we would find in Mishkan Tfilah in our prayer book. And here is the translation that I would like to offer you today, which is not the translation that you would find in the Mishkan Tfilah, that not the translation that we will find in our prayer book. But I just want to go through this with you for a moment because it is such an important uh, blessing that we don't often uh, recite and that we don't often delve into. Um, it starts with acknowledgement and recognition. An acknowledgement and recognition that we are somehow parts of a chain of being that extends from time immemorial uh, that we may know three, four, five, perhaps six generations of our families. Sometimes we know more about certain parts of certain generations of our families going back. There are families that know some history going back 10 generations, perhaps, but it's only some history. It's not all of the history. We are part of a very long chain, and that chain is largely invisible to us. We don't know it. And that chain, therefore, is a chain of anonymity. That chain of anonymity is a chain of eternity. And it is a chain of eternity that represents life. It represents being. It represents something that is within us, that we cannot entirely point to. And that is part of the mystery. It is part of the mystery that we attribute to the source of being, that we attribute to our lives. And so when we say, you are the rock of our lives, the shield of our redemption, of our survival, of our being here from generation to generation, we acknowledge mystery. We acknowledge that which we cannot see. We acknowledge that which we do not know. And we acknowledge that which has been profoundly human from generation to generation, going back to those times of which we know nothing. And that is glorious. That is special. That is unique. This is the glory of our lives that we refer to, that in certain ways are in the hands of being. They are in the hands of this chain of life that governs our world. Those souls that are our souls, that are the product of so much that we do not know and that in certain ways belong to something that is greater than we are. 
and the notion of those miracles that remain with us unseen every day. The wonders, the graces, our ability to live our lives with all of the unknowns, not of the past, but of the present, that accompany us at all times, morning, noon, and evening. I'd like for us for a moment to see what is happening here in the Modim Anachnulach, in that paradigmatic blessing of gratitude in our Amida, wherein the rabbis, the liturgist, turn from the past to the present and turn to this notion of mystery, play with the known and the unknown, and our ability to acknowledge and to see both the known and the unknown. I'd like us to think about this for a moment, because this is essential to Judaism. And it's essential to what we see today and what we feel today together. And I'd like us to talk about it. Judaism is in part about acknowledging and seeing that which we do not know that which we cannot account for, and being able to offer gratitude for it. This is a moment wherein we must do that. And so I want to introduce this blessing to us, this magnificent blessing, which is part of the Shemona Esrei, and then move to the second part of the Shemona Esrei, and then lead us to a little bit of a discussion of what we make of it, what we now do, and how we move forward on this basis. Here we go again. And so let us offer our thanks to a notion of the God of our ancestors and a God of eternity, not only of our ancestors, but also of a future and to acknowledge that we are part of a chain of life. And that chain of life is a rock. It is something that is lasting and that is lasting beyond us. It is a shield and it is a shield of survival and of redemption from generation to generation. We are here and we want to offer gratitude for being here. And now we want to say for a moment a thank you for the fact of being here, for our souls, for our spirits that are with us and greater than we are, and for the wonders, the graces, the miracles that accompany us every single day, all the time that spare us from all kinds of trouble every single day. This is the essence of the Modim Anachnulach, which again starts with acknowledgement, with recognition, with the ability to for a moment lift our eyes and consider that which we do not know, that which is mysterious to us, that which enables us to live that we cannot account for, and then to give thanks. And so I'm going to call on you, each and every one of you, in our own ways, to offer our little Modim Anachnulach, a blessing of gratitude at this moment. Let's just take a few seconds, and each person in his or her own words, let's together offer to ourselves a moment of gratitude.
Well, following this moment and this prayer, and thank you for again indulging me and indulging each other and being together here in community to pray and to give thanks uh, for us and for our remarkable being here in community, given everything that is going on in our lives and all that has happened in the last day. Let us for a moment think about where we go from here. What this moment means. What happened in Colville, Texas? What has happened in other places? And where is it that we go? And what do we now do as a congregation? What do we now do as a community to move ourselves forward, to enable us to live the kind of lives and to be the kind of force for the goodness that we need to spread in the world? What is it that now we do? How do we move forward? How do we enable this moment, which we have just experienced, to become a moment for good? A moment not only for good, but for the spread of good, for the spread of wellness among ourselves and among others. Um, now, I really would like to invite you to unmute and to share some thoughts. This is, this is our time to participate. Rabbi. Roman. The Friday night service was incredible. When the service was over and Pastor Gibson gave such an inspiring talk, it was most appropriate, although we didn't really mention, I sent you a thing from the, from, uh, the Holocaust Museum. Yes. I hope you got it. I did, thank you, finally, yes. Yeah, but here's an individual, a Christian, who has the same feelings, the same attitude as we do, a prayer for peace. Uh, but the sad part is, this has been going on for 2000 years, the anti-Semitism, uh, all of the things that go with it. And when it was all said and done, and what you're saying this morning, what is there that I and my wife can do to fight it, except live our lives that we live. You know, a congregation like ours, what can we do in the greater good, except live our lives? I'm a little bit overwhelmed because when he was finished Friday night, I really felt great. Um, Here's an individual, an individual who's very known in the community, very involved in the community. And where do we go? We as a congregation, I, I have no ideas. Well, we have a number of ideas. Um, we, Pastor Gibson and I are already now um, in discussion about engaging in numerous moments of prayer together, moving forward. We are already in touch about engaging in learning together. And we are already in touch with regard to engaging in action together. And uh, the key to our work with Pastor Gibson is not going to be events or moments of gathering. I think that the key to our work with Pastor Gibson and with others 
will be, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the building of relationships, of true bridges, of understanding and of friendship and of collaboration in the context of which we know each other. We come to know each other. We come to be able to speak to each other. And we come to be able to rely on each other. I want to tell you something, Roman, and I'm going to be very personal here. Five years ago this month, I was in France for, I was in Paris for a memorial service of a relative who had passed away. And I was sitting in the memorial service on the 1st of January for this relative who had passed away for my phone to explode with messages. I rushed out of the service to discover that the front sign of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, my campus, of which I was the dean, had a swastika spray painted on it. The first person to appear on the campus and to offer his support and help was my friend, the Imam of the Clifton Mosque, who came onto the campus before eight o'clock in the morning, knocking on my door, waiting for me to open the door, not realizing I wasn't there. We spoke very quickly and saying to the security officer, I am Imam Ismail, how can I help? We are here for you. How can I help? That was the product of bridge building, of relationship building. That wouldn't have happened had there not been work done and true understanding and true friendship built up over years. This particular imam had spent Passover with us. He and his family and his children celebrated the Passover with us. And during the Passover, Seder, with us, put out carpets on the floor to pray their prayer during the Passover Seder. The following day, a group of churches that we had been affiliated with came together and encircled the campus of Hebrew Union College in a ring of peace. This is the kind of work that we need to do. In other words, where do we take it from here with Pastor Gibson? I think we have an opportunity to build bridges. We have an opportunity to counter anti-Semitism. We have an opportunity to teach. We have an opportunity to talk about it. And we have an opportunity to get to know our neighbors and that which bothers them and to work together towards doing good in our community for everybody for all of us. And I think this is our task. So I don't want you to be despondent following Friday night and following this moment with Pastor Gibson. I want you to hear, as far as I'm concerned, it's not an end, it's a beginning. When we first had a service, a Friday night service with the Armenian community and then a second one, I thought, wow, this was never heard of. And here but, we are. And here we are going to meet again with them in April. In April, we have another one. And we are in constant touch with them. And this is what it's about. We we must be the kind of neighbors that live truly the values of our Judaism, not only for ourselves, but for others around us. It's the right thing to do. It's the Jewish thing to do. 
And this is where we go from here. I think. Thank you. Rabbi? Please. My experience, unfortunately, I have tried numerous years. Um, and I was, for example, I was the only white person in the Jesse Owens program at Tri-C at Metro Campus. And um, my students were all 13 to 15 year old black teenagers. And the culmination of the six week program was they, their behavior was bad. We did a field trip to the zoo sponsored by my brother who was active at the zoo. They were poorly behaved. All of our speakers were African-American, which I thought was great. Um, but the end of this day, they actually, I had to run out of the building for my life. They were going to beat me up. Now, a year and a half ago, I was doing a program called Life Act, sponsored by University Hospital. The purpose was to um, teach kids about uh, dealing with depression, anti-suicide. I went all over the city. I worked with 2000 students. The pay was nothing really. I did it because I thought I'm making a difference. So what happened? The last class I taught at was actually my former, my junior high school of many, many years ago. And uh, a child uh, complained to her mother, she lied, if the teacher was in the room. So, I mean, there was a witness. The, the, the student went home and told her mother, this lady's teaching me how to commit suicide. The mother called the teach, the principal. The principal called the company I worked for and I got fired like that. I got fired, my reputation was dirt. And I have tried this, I've had many experiences like this and I'm very discouraged. I think if you deal with the people you're dealing with, yeah, it works, but down with the younger people, they told me such hate that they had for Jews. It really has discouraged me. And I, I'm listening to you and you are a wonderful man and they're wonderful people in the community, but I have been in the trenches, not with the big shots, but the trenches. And it's not working there and in my experience. Help. Yeah, Linda, thank you. Thank you for, for saying this. And, and, and uh, I, I so appreciate, I want you to know, I'm not, these are not empty words. I am I do I deeply appreciate your sharing this here in this group. I know how difficult it is to share these things. Uh, and I deeply appreciate your sharing your experience and and I want you to know uh, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Uh, I don't think of myself as some kind of a hot shot, and I don't <laughs> think that I particularly uh, 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 engage with others uh, uh, who are hot shots. Uh, and I have experienced many difficult and disappointing experiences with minority communities, whether it's in the African-American community, whether it's with a number of others. There are people on this call who can tell you horror stories about going out to register vote, to register voters, and who have doors slammed in their faces uh, and, who are, uh, and, and who are trying to do good and who are frustrated because of a lack of willingness on the other side to engage. Uh, there is a great deal of ill will. There is a great misunderstanding of us. There is a great deal of, 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 um, of challenge in engaging in that work. You are right. And I am not Pollyannish about this. And I don't believe that this, there, is a, there is some kind of a silver bullet here. Uh, or that there is a simple way to go about this. The work that we do is difficult work. And sometimes uh, we are faced with hatred and sometimes we are faced with terribly frustrating and hurtful uh, 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 circumstances that prevent us from moving forward. And at the same time, we have to find a way forward. And there is much that we must do and we must come together and figure out how we do it and how it is that we spend our energies in the most effective and impactful ways. And this is part of our task, not from a Pollyannish place, not from a place that says it's going to be easy and that everything is going to work and we're just gonna go out 
and do wonderful things together because that's not life. And, and so many of us have the scars to show for it. But I don't know that we can sit back and say, we're just not going to do this anymore. I don't know that we are able to say, let's give up on it. Let's give up on the vision. Uh, we have neighbors. We are a minority. We need these relationships with others. We need to understand others and for others to understand us. And we need to work towards that. And it's part of who we are. It is part of our identity. It is part of our value system to bring about goodness and to repair where repair is possible. And it's sometimes very difficult, painful, and frustrating work. And I, you know, Linda, we've spoken about this in person. You've told me about these things that you've now shared with the group. And I recall being so deeply affected by what you told me um, and, and recognizing some of the challenges that I myself have experienced and that I've heard of from others. Uh, and, and, and this is not something that I'm setting aside. In other words, this is part of our reality. So thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you for sharing your words with us. Um, let, me, let me try to respond to yet another question. Uh, Erwin Lowenstein, who is the chair of our Racial Justice Task Force, who's uh, um, uh, a board member of, of ours, uh, asked a question and asked me to present the question because he's in a loud place and is, un, is, 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 is not uh, able to really uh, speak with us uh, from the place that he is. And he said uh, in his question, and I want to not paraphrase, but I want to really um, to, to, to ask the question in his words. Um, and, and the question is, how do we best teach fellow Jews that the vast majority of Islamist faith groups are peace-loving and anti-terrorist? And what does the rabbinic literature say about us forgiving the terrorist? I find it hard to think about forgiveness for such a heinous, for such a hateful, a heinous, a, a, a heinous act. And, and so um, let's talk about this for a moment. And I'm going to mostly focus on the first question as opposed to the second question. Um, and, and I, again, will, will in the vein, in, in the context of what we have just said, I would like to, to respond in the following way. We cannot, again, be Pollyannish. We have to be realistic. Um, we have to know that not everybody loves us. We have to know that there is hate out there for us, for Jews, and there is hate out there for Israel, and that hatred for Israel colors people's relationships with us. We have to be realistic about these things. There is no doubt that in spite of all of that, our task, our job, while maintaining realism, is to give the people surrounding us the benefit of the doubt. And not only to give the people surrounding us the benefit of the doubt, but not to judge people because our judgment of people will likely fall into the kind of generalization that has so profoundly affected our people when we and previous generations of Jews have been judged and generalized about. And I think our task is to rise and to recognize the world that we live in to recognize the challenges of, of the world that we live in. And in spite of the challenges, to reach out to our Muslim neighbors, to reach out to Islamic groups, not from a place of uh, assumption that everything is going to be just wonderful and that we're going to absolutely agree on everything 
and that in a moment they're going to join the World Zionist Organization. <laughs> but from a place of true understanding and humility, that we may be where we are and they are going to be where they are and we need to learn to know them and to understand them and to hear their story and to understand what it is that animates them, what it is that is at the core of their passions and to seek to build some kind of understanding where understanding is possible. The work that we need to do is real work. It's not some kind of fairy tale. And it doesn't have an immediate happy ending. For those of us who have engaged in this work for years and decades, it's hard. It's ongoing. It requires real commitment. And we need to do the work. And there is really no other choice. There is no other choice. And I don't know whether you saw it, but CARE, C-A-I-R, um, and other Muslim groups in Texas stood in support of Rabbi Citron Walker throughout this last day. Imams came to the junior high school in Colville, Texas. And why did this happen? It happened because Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker and others like him have decided to move beyond their comfort zones and to do the hard work of building relationships, not with a view to altering people's opinions or, or beliefs, or to, to create some kind of a fairy tale, but in a commitment to do the hard work of getting to know our neighbors and understanding them and building relationships and understandings where that work is possible. We can make a difference in our world and there is no easy way to do it, but we have to, we have to. That is why we are here. So I'm not going to speak to the question of forgiveness right now. Uh, and I am at this moment not particularly in a place of forgiveness either, though I hope to one day get there. Uh, the question of forgiveness is a bigger question that we don't really have the time for right now. Thank you for asking it. And I want to acknowledge um, the, the, the question but I, I did want to respond to the first part of, of this question and to, to see whether you feel that this response is in some way satisfactory. Rabbi, um, I don't mean to monopolize this, but I just have one comment to Linda, if I may. Linda, I've been teaching Sunday school, going around giving talks for almost 40 years. And I've learned one thing, that the young people or even the teenagers that you've been dealing with, they were not born to hate. Their parents taught them to hate. And we don't know what all of the single parent families feel about we who have and they that don't. And this is how Hitler got started, dealing with the least common denominator, those that don't have. And they're the ones who follow. Thank you. Sorry, Rabbi. That's okay, Roman. That's okay. I'm sorry. Did someone else? Um, Rabbi, this is yeah. um, Melissa. Yes, Melissa. You know, one thing that I think might be really wonderful. I was glad to hear that you are in conversations with some more programming with fellow um, clergy. Uh, in other denominations. And I know one thing I am always appreciative of, I teach at Tri-C. Yeah. And when I look out at community events uh, regarding social action of some sort and, and usually more charitable events, I'm always really happy when I see that 
um, the, the the drives, whether it's a, it's a food drive or or a coat drive or maybe did you know digital information, etc. That when they're sponsored, um, and you know maybe they're coming from faith leaders, da da da. And I often note, sadly, that there's no one in the Jewish community participating in a lot of those, or I'm not seeing them. And again, this is because I'm focusing on what's happening downtown. Um, so it would be wonderful. And, and, and I'm just thinking about, you know, if we can get more, the Jewish community um, can, can be more involved in it. I know it's, it might sound- um, Council Jewish women. Just, just so, you know, people but, see that along with the uh, UCC, uh, and you know, Catholic charities. It's the JCC, and what are also supporting these uh, as well, because it's that subtle but important reminder that the Jewish community is involved in these as well. I mean, for those of us who are on the east side, we know what's we know how active these things are. We we know that we do take care of each other, and we know the, the places to go. But because I teach out on the west side, and that, and that might also be very skewing my perspective, and I'm welcome to hear from others, but I, I'm very much aware that I don't see uh, that information so much there, and and but in terms of downtown as well. And so maybe those of you who work downtown, maybe you see more regarding community activism uh, that recognizes Jewish stuff out there, um, because. It's one thing to make connections with other religious faiths and promoting goodwill. But I also think the larger target in, in terms of tikkun olam and are the white, well, we aren't gonna change white nationalists, but just to raising awareness community-wide, those are, like, oh, the Jewish community is also doing this stuff. That's great. I don't know. Yeah. That's my little tip. Melissa, Melissa I, I thank you for this. Uh, I would like to speak with you further about this. And I would like to speak with, with you further about this. And I would like to see whether we can uh, also engage in a conversation with our social action committee sure, and I mean, with, our racial, <laughs> with our racial justice task force, as well as others. Uh, and uh, and I want uh, and I want you to know that this is something that's been on our agenda and that we're expanding, cool. uh, and that I think uh, we may need your help and your feedback to engage in more strategically, and to think about where it is that we are not seen, that we might want to be seen, uh, or be seen in 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 a in a, in a more effective way moving forward. Uh, you know, we have a number of people on this call who have been deeply, deeply engaged in different uh, parts of the work. I don't want to um, mention names and embarrass people, but there are a number of people who've been engaged in a number of efforts. Um, uh, and I, I want to make sure that we engage in this conversation and that I learn from you what you are seeing and that we are able to perhaps move forward on that basis in a more effective way uh, and really connect you with the right people in our congregation because a great deal is being done. Um, thank you for this, Melissa. Thank you. And let's follow up. Um, I want to also acknowledge uh, a question that was sent to me. Uh, and um, I, I'm not going to acknowledge the person who asked the question because it was sent to me privately. But the question relates to uh, Pastor Gibson's uh, uh, sermon for us, Dvar Torah for us, this last Friday, and the question of war and his use of the language of war. Uh, I don't know whether you are reading the press uh, this past weekend, but I am reading the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune, and in the newspapers that I read, uh, the eight or nine newspapers that I read from throughout the country, um, I can tell you that in six of them, and I'm, I'm not going to run through all of them, uh, of this past, the last three days, there are major editorials and op-ed pieces 
speaking of America tearing itself apart and the notion of war and the notion of us being undone, of America being undone. Uh, and these are conservative thinkers as well as liberal thinkers who are offering these thoughts. Uh, and so this is not unique to one particular uh, uh, political, uh, political view. Um, I want us to think about the language of war that was used by Pastor, Gib by Pastor Gibson this last Friday. And for us, not only to think about the language of war, but about waging war and standing up and standing up to counter others as opposed to waging peace and thinking about peace and bringing about peace and actively waging a campaign of peace, a campaign of building bridges, a campaign of coming together, a campaign of moving forward in particular ways that are going to strengthen our community. And, uh, and the person who asked me this question spoke about the language of war and of peace. And I think it's a very important point that she raises and I want to be, uh, I want to recognize it and I want to offer thanks for this particular question that was raised with me privately and to recognize uh, it and, and, and to recognize also the other contributions for everyone to see in the chat room. Um, anything else before we, we conclude this session? Uh, are there any additional thoughts? Eva, are, do, do you want yeah, to say something? I just wanted to jump in and say how we cannot minimize the importance of the support that our board and congregation gives to you and in an outreach program. Lots of congregations have been so resistant to that idea. It's a relatively new a force in a Jewish community. So many communities, I think, still feel very protective of their congregation and they don't know how to reach out or they're not willing to reach out. And that does often originate with the board and I am so proud of our board for being so supportive and, and for I am, you being so uh, uh, proactive. Thank you, Ava. Method. Thank you so much, Ava. And I am grateful too. I am deeply, deeply grateful too. Um, I am deeply grateful too. Thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yes, and we do have the support and. And not only that, I think that we recognize that this is the time. This is the time. Um, I, I know Susan wanted to say something because I think she raised her hand. Susan, is that correct? Thank you. Um, I guess, I, Rabbi Cohen, I so appreciate just your general leadership in this space. And I know that this comes really from your heart and then you bring the head into the mix and, and remind us of the history. One thing that I've been learning a lot in this work is how uncomfortable it will be and that you can't shy away from the discomfort. And that the other piece of it that we learn is when you walk alongside communities that have been historically marginalized and that are hurting so much, you're gonna take some of the blows. You're not cushioned from that. And sometimes they're gonna come from them too because they, People are angry and they're so frustrated. If you imagine your life as a black person in this nation and what has gone on for 400 years and look at where we are today, where now we're, we're wanting to mandate that you can't teach the true history. I mean, that is actually happening right now in Ohio. I, I guess what I wanna just say is I wanna honor that discomfort and also say that it, it's worth the work that I, I've talked to some black friends who say, you know, when I go home at six o'clock, guess what? I'm still black. And I think for those of us who have degrees of privilege, it's understanding that we sometimes can walk away from that and that that's where you almost gain privilege and you gain, gain resilience and strength. And how might we all use that to, you know, on this weekend, we honor Dr. King to someday create that beloved community and not be so 
focused on scarcity, but think about how we create wealth for everybody. Thank you, Susan. I'm 100% with you. I'm 100% with you. And, uh, and your experience matches mine. Um, it is hard and there is discomfort in it. And, um, and for those of us who have been um, in, in, the, in the Baptist church and experienced being the only white person there, uh, and experienced a real conversation. Um, you're, you are so right. Uh, and yet we cannot step away. So thank you for this. Thank you. Um, Meryl, did you want to say something? Did I see you raise your hand? Uh, Rabbi, I, I, yeah. I had wanted to say something, but I put it in the chat. Okay. And um, my main point was that we, I, I totally hear the work. frustration of the people who feel flattened by experiences that I've had, flattened by yesterday, flattened by the cumulative effect. I feel flattened much of the time. Professionally, in my work as a teacher, I engage these issues on a regular basis. Personally, as I deal with variety of situations um, with my health, et cetera. And, and the, the challenge is always to bounce back and to, to get up off the floor and try again. And mostly I wanted to thank you for helping me off the floor this morning. Meryl, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for saying this. Thank you for sharing this. And just know um, there are people here who are going to stand with you and who are going to do everything they can to ensure that you're not on the floor and to help you off the floor when we are. This is true for all of us. We, we all find ourselves on the floor at some times. Um, please know um, so much of us are afflicted in these different ways. I wish you well uh, with, your, with all of the challenges that you're facing. Um, let's follow up, let's talk, and let's see how we can support each other, okay? And, uh, and, and we'll, we'll continue, we'll, 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 we'll continue, we'll find a way to continue. Thank you. Uh, friends, it is almost 12.30. Um, and I would like to wrap this, uh, this up. I, I'm deeply moved by what's emerged here. And I'm grateful for this moment with you yet again. You have supported each other and me at a time of real need and at a time um, of real upheaval for many of us in our lives. And I'd like to conclude with that which is familiar to all of us. Um, please unmute yourselves for a moment. I know this is going to sound like a complete and utter mess, but it's okay. And please join together with me. Ose shalom bimoma. Uya se shalom aleinu May the source of peace bring peace to us, to all Israel, and to all those who dwell on our earth. And we say to that, together we say to that. Amen. I wish you a good week. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you, you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership. Yes. Oh, hey.
to do. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm going to help. 